All set. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are all well. Uh, I appreciate you attending uh, this uh, cultural town hall. We have uh, a lot of information to provide you. Uh, there's been a lot of changes, as you all know, in the last week or so with regards to COVID-19, as such as that we originally had planned on not having a press conference today, but due to the mask requirements, the rules that are now in effect, we decided that Dr. Burstein and I will have a conference at two o'clock our normal time. Uh, there's just too much, too much uh, confusion in the public uh, as to what the rules are. Uh, I can just briefly say the rules are the CDC said if you're vaccinated, you no longer need to wear masks. Uh, if you're unvaccinated or you are immunocompromised, you should wear masks. Uh, the problem is, is there seems to be a general perception that no one needs to wear masks anymore, and that is not correct. And for independent organizations, you can set whatever standard you want. You can require all attendees. Uh, all workers to wear masks if you so choose, even if they're vaccinated. So, uh, we uh, have a lot of information to share with the public starting at 2, but uh, we did want to uh, give each and every one of you an opportunity to uh, uh, participate in this town hall, even if I have to step aside, which I will eventually. Uh, we will have staff from all the uh, departments, executive office, as well as the Department of Environment Planning. Uh, on as well as the Department of Health. Uh, I, I believe she is on our chairwoman, uh, April Baskin, and I certainly uh, thank her for her great work that we do, our partnership over this past year and a half, especially as it pertains to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but also as it pertains to supporting arts and cultural institutions in our community. So I'd like to offer uh, Chairwoman Baskin an opportunity to uh, say a few words. I believe she's on. the chairwoman there i'm not seeing her on just now she'll probably join us as soon as we can it's probably a bit of um technical difficulties well we can return to the chairwoman if she should happen to come on i think there may be an issue with the system i had a little difficulty logging in and if I have a problem with my computer logging into a county based system, that's not good. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, uh, she is, uh, will have an opportunity to, uh, to participate. Uh, with that, uh, is Dr. Burstein on? I know there's, there's a lot of running around these last, uh, 24 hours because we're trying to adopt new policies as well for county government. So the timing of this, unfortunately, is not what we would have liked. Uh, and I think Dr. Burstein is right now dealing with our personnel office on a policy with regards to employees and the public effective tomorrow, uh, which I've been involved in. So I don't see Dr. Burstein on either. It's been a crazy I period, think... folks. Uh, so why don't I just uh, at this point, uh, Mary, why don't you go through the survey results and, and Dr. will probably join in and when, when the opportunity uh, begins for her. Yes, thank you. I'll keep an eye out for them. Uh, make sure they can join us as soon as possible. So I'll go quickly over the survey responses. Hopefully you can see this. If not, please let us know in the chat. Either to me or to David Hall. We'll be uh, trying to read through your chat. So we got about 64 responses. The majority are from Buffalo, which is not unexpected. Another five from Amherst, Williamsville area, and then one each for more of the uh, either rural or outer core of the urban area, which is fairly reflective of organizations that we fund and generally, I think, culturals in Erie County. Of the 64 responses, the top three common needs, surprising no one funding came up on top. Uh, we saw a lot of questions um, or concerns regarding general operating support for rents, utilities, maintenance funds, or maintenance, um, of course, funding programs and not front costs. Um, a lot of, of uh, concerns about retaining or hiring back staff as well. Um, one second, let me open. 
open the other portion here. I apologize. Got too many screens going right now. Let's see if I can make a little space over here. I want to make sure I bring up uh, funding to get artists back to work and paid. Um, uh, many mentioned as well funding for additional staff to enforce or maintain the sanitizing and other COVID specific guidelines um, and safety protocols, as well as funding for virtual programs or software and the increased amount of administrative work that that has all entailed this past year. So next up was uh, reopening help and guidelines. Just, I know we are all kind of all over the place trying to figure out what the guidelines are, what you need to do. I know many had concerns about having different types of uh, operations within their one organization or one venue and how to um, get all of those different guidelines to work together. Um, many requested um, an opportunity to clarify concerns with a subject matter expert, uh, funding for hand sanitizers, touchless, touchless payment options, ventilation needs, plastic barriers, uh, whether patrons need to be screened, a lot of questions about how it works and what they need to do. Um, some mentioned that they were ineligible for existing programs that help with PPE and such and other COVID related programs. And I'd like to hear more about that once we open up the session uh, later on. And as well, uh, many expressed concerns about just getting more people vaccinated and uh, making sure our immigrant community was getting that information and access to the vaccination. Uh, third need was marketing. So uh, many of you mentioned a countywide campaign or similar to build up some of that audience comfort and coming back to the venues. Um, many mentioned school programs and trips, as well as tour rules and what, how those have been affecting you and whether they will change. Um, and someone mentioned as well a local, or many people mentioned a local audience readiness survey to kind of see where people are at and uh, what we need to get them back into uh, our venue. A couple of other concerns that were mentioned, I listed here. Um, so a couple of different organizations may have mentioned multiple versions of this. They mentioned capital improvements. They mentioned equity and diversity uh, in the workforce, uh, reaching out to community, like a, building a stronger community connection. Uh, they mentioned strategic planning. They mentioned City of Buffalo funding, um, resources for board, board members. They mentioned a lot of collaboration, and um, they commented on how that is sometimes uh, almost punished or, or made, made uh, organizations compete against one another instead of rewarding collaboration and partnerships. So that was something mentioned. Uh, the greatest long-term need that I saw through the survey responses was general operating support and also reinforcing the role of arts and culture in quality of life and the economy. Now there was some specific county uh, funding, county process comments, so I kind of brought those out a little separate. Uh, they were concerned that the new applicants weren't funded this past for this year. Um, some questions about how the funding amounts relate to the rating system uh, wanting the um, the funding system to be consistent, regardless of uh, you know when your elected official moves on to a different position or whatever it may be, and also uh, what happens to organizations that don't fit the cultural funding program. I am that is generally a summary of uh, the responses we got. It was, there was a lot of really interesting information and I really thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I think there's a couple of things that we will want to follow up on separately from this uh, town hall, some good points and some good observations and ideas that were provided. And I'm trying to see if I can find Dr. Bursting in our list here. but I think they might still be having some difficulties logging in. Okay. So, uh, Jen Delaney, would you be able to do oh, hi, the I'm department here. of Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, there you are. Sure, I see you. Yes. 
sorry. Sorry about that. Thank sorry. you. I'm sure that you were looking for me. Yeah. So I'm Gail Versine, the Erie County Health Commissioner. Just want to thank you all for uh, for tuning in and helping us uh, think about how to reopen our um, our most precious asset, one of our most precious assets in Erie County, our cultural events and uh, and partners. So I just want to give you a kind of a brief update where we are with COVID nineteen, and then um, and then present some resources that we have for you. And, and then I have to get off because um, the county executive and I have to do a press conference at two o'clock. And uh, Jennifer Delaney, who is our super expert, um, our division director of environmental health, will be able to stick around and answer questions for you. So uh, let me get going. Um, first of all, the good news, uh, the, the big picture, the number of reported COVID-19 cases in Erie County is, is really is finally on the decline again. Um, so with uh, as of, um, of May 15th, there were 88 new cases reported on that day of COVID-19. Um, and um, one weight that we look at that's important is um, the number of cases that we get over the past seven days. So uh, we only had 733 cases reported in the seven days prior to that. So uh, that's a, a hallmark being under 1,000. So we were really excited about that. Also, uh, our number of new cases per 100,000 population over a week's time is 80, so that's under 100. So we've moved from a high risk transmission area to a substantial risk transmission area. So um, that allows us to uh, to open up um, schools more, and um, and hopefully, uh, you know, businesses will feel a little bit more comfortable opening up. And then, so far since we started counting COVID-19 cases, we've had 87,957. Um, unique uh, COVID-19 infections reported to us in Erie County. Next, please. Among Erie County residents. So, um, just uh, let me talk to you about the, um, you know, some assets that we have to to offer you all to help you uh, uh, open up and stay open. So, first of all, I think I haven't said it. I can't say it enough that the way we are gonna get out of this pandemic is vaccination. Vaccination is our ticket out of this pandemic. So if you can make sure that all your staff are vaccinated, you will have an easier time of, of getting open and staying open. So in the Erie County Health Department, we have multiple vaccine clinics every single day. We have pop-up clinics uh, at senior housing, um, different events in the community, different businesses, parks, festivals, you name it, we want to be there. And if you have ideas about co-hosting a, a, a vaccine clinic in one of your venues, we would be very interested. Anything that we can do to make it easier, to make a smart choice to get vaccinated by bringing the service right to the people, right where we're going in a comfortable place is what we're all about. Uh, we've been offering clinics for uh, teenagers at schools. Uh, we've had some fun uh, vaccine clinics. Uh, you've, I'm sure you've heard our county executive's brilliant idea the shot in the chaser clinics where you get a shot of COVID-19 vaccine and you get to chase it down with a nice pint of beer. Um, on, you can register for any of these clinics on our Erie County Health Department website or call 858-2929 or just walk in. We accept all walk-ins. Nobody's turned away if we have a vaccine that uh, you're eligible for. Next, please. So another, I think, key component to being able to stay open with your business is to make sure that everybody gets tested. It's important to know your status. You know, recently, we've had uh, we've been working with many businesses where uh, they've designated their they where they've had a case of COVID nineteen among one of their employees, and then they've designated all their other employees as essential workers. So everybody had this, so they so they required all the, their close contacts employees to come to work. And then, you know, people didn't get tested and they were infected. And then they, we had multiple outbreaks in these different businesses and the businesses had to, you know, sometimes temporarily close because they just didn't have the staff to keep it open. So it's really important, a key strategy to keeping your business open is making sure that people get tested appropriately, especially if there is a case amongst you, uh, you wanna make sure that everybody else knows their status and can uh, and take the appropriate uh, actions. So, um, so if we offer um, full uh, 
COVID-19 testing at the Erie County Health Department. You can call 858-2929 to schedule an appointment. These are free diagnostic tests. You can either get a polymerase chain reaction, um, which is a molecular diagnostic test, and the turnaround time is anywhere between one to three business days. But um, now we're we're um, you know we're really moving, so you should probably you will get it in one to two business days. And then we have point of care rapid testing uh, available. And remember, if you are a close contact and you were exposed to somebody with COVID-19 um, and you're vaccinated, you um, you are pretty much, you're very protected and you don't necessarily have to quarantine, but we still recommend you get tested to know your status. Next, please. Also, uh, the, um, the Erie County Health Department wants to, wants to be a resource for you to help you answer your questions so you can follow the New York State rules to, uh, to keep your businesses open and safe for your employees and for your uh, customers and your patrons. So uh, we want to direct everybody to New York Forward that has all the uh, industry guidance for um, any type of large events, festivals, fundraisers, um, all different types of businesses. Um, we recommend that you develop a safety plan plan um, as per New York forward guidance, and then also as a uh, really encourage your staff to get fully vaccinated, and um, then you'll have less of a risk of any type of outbreaks that can, can threaten your business staying open. Also, um, you know, we want to answer your questions. I know this is really confusing. I know there's a lot of new information. So what we're going to propose is having a, um, a uh, weekly Q&A webinars, because if one person has a question, probably 10 other people at least have the same question. So I think we could be more efficient than, you know, repeatedly get the same questions from all these different people. Um, if we can have a, uh, like a, a kind of a group Q and A session on a weekly basis to answer everybody's questions, I think would be the most uh, productive. So if you want to participate in these webinars, um, please uh, send an email to large events at erie.gov, or you can call our environmental health office at 716. 961 6800 and you can get on the list and we can send you invitations and you have an opportunity on a weekly basis to answer questions and you know hopefully eventually we won't need these but i know this is new it's hard and uh, we want to be a resource for you to provide all the information that we can next please so i think that's it thanks Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat for you at this point. Uh, we'll move on to ECIDA and uh, hold on to those or come back to them as needed. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about the ECIDA's COVID-19 disaster emergency grant application. Um, this is, this is a new product to the ECIDA. We're typically not allowed to provide grants, but in response to COVID-19, uh, New York State amended the general municipal law temporarily to allow IDAs to provide grants um, specifically for PPE and fixtures necessary to uh, keep, um, prevent the spread, the fur further spread of coronavirus. Um, so, the ECIDA developed a grant pro program and began accepting applications in August of 2020. So eligibility for this uh, grant, small businesses and not-for-profits, so uh, 50 employees or less. Um, they must conduct business in the, in the ECIDA service area, which is Erie County, but it excludes Amherst, Clarence, Concord, Lancaster, and Hamburg, because those communities have their own municipal IDA. So they're served by their own, their own IDA. Um, to be eligible, you must be either located in a highly distressed area, um, and there is a map on our website that shows you where, where those areas are, or a minority woman or veteran owned business operation. So for a not-for-profit, the only way you, uh, you meet the eligibility is to be located in the highly distressed area. Uh, your, your business or not-for-profit has to have been operational prior to, to March 7th, 2020, and it had to have been viable. Um, 
You have to, in your application, talk about how you have been negatively impacted by the uh, disaster declaration and the COVID shutdown, which is not really difficult to do, you know, we, but we do need specifics. You know, how, how many months were you closed? Did you reopen to reduce capacity? Did you lay off staff? Are you having a difficult time attracting staff back because they're concerned about uh, getting sick? So um, you do have to provide a little bit of narrative. Um, and then our, our grant is very narrow. You know, we cannot help with rent and, and, uh, and hiring and those type of things. We can only assist with um, eligible purchases of PPE and fixtures. Um, so the process is uh, there, the website is listed on the slide and there is an application. It's unfortunately, it's not a fillable form. You do have to download the application and fill it out and mail it in. Um, and there's also some documentation that we require. The applications are reviewed on a monthly basis. So um, there's a relatively quick turnaround. Um, the program will expire either when the ECIDA runs out of funding or if the executive order is rescinded. It's set to expire at this point, uh, December 31st of 2021. But if it were to be rescinded prior to that, we wouldn't be able to accept any, any additional applications. And it is a reimbursement program. So you do have to uh, make the expenditures and then uh, prove that you purchased the items and then you would be reimbursed if you were a successful applicant. Uh, so that is basically it in a nutshell. Um, my contact information is on the slide. I know that several of the um, culturals participating in in this uh, town hall have been successful applicants. So, um, you know, hopefully they've been talking up the program to to folks that they know. But if anybody has any questions about whether they're located in, in an eligible area or any questions at all, they can they can contact me. Thank you. Oh, am I supposed to? I guess I'm supposed to pass it over to Jen and Holly from ASI. Thank you, Lori. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jen Swanico Patrick uh, from Art Services Initiative, uh, well, formerly Initiative, now Inc., uh, ASI. Many of you uh, know us already. I just want to take a minute or two to recap really quickly the services and resources from ASI, um, and then in particular, uh, how we've really shifted that focus uh, in the last year related to COVID and pandemic assistance, um, but also how that will look um, and what we're looking from you as far as how that evolves and changes uh, through 2021 and beyond uh, just these last two years um, in, in the current landscape that we're in. Um, so quick overview, uh, we have uh, a few core resources that we help either nonprofit arts and culturals or independent artists working in their particular artistic discipline. Uh, we provide them some capacity building tools and resources the core of that is uh, we have one component that's funding. So we have anywhere from five to seven different funding programs in any given year uh, that can assist uh, with arts projects, sometimes in some cases operations and general operating support, as was, was mentioned earlier. Um, we also have a bookkeeping and fiscal sponsorship program uh, that we can help build that capacity uh, in that financial arena for particularly arts organizations or individuals or coalitions that may not have nonprofit status, but need that added ability to um, apply for funds or find uh, funding elsewhere. What's uh, really important that I really want to point out on this slide is the fourth bullet point. Uh, we have an updated opportunities page uh, on our website, uh, we have different categories that we share regularly, and we're always getting emails almost daily on different opportunities. Uh, some may apply to you, some may not, uh, but we have calls for work, residencies, other funding opportunities just beyond ASI. So it could be third party funding opportunities, uh, could be statewide, regional, national. Uh, we try to make sure that everyone has that information. Uh, the best way to get that, if you, if 
you do not want to go to our website every day and kind of check on those updates. We do send out weekly emails. So the best way to get on that list uh, would be to sign up for our constant contact. Uh, and we usually send that out on a Monday and it'll uh, spotlight some different areas, maybe newer upcoming resources, uh, but then you can always go to the website for the full list. We always have never ending lists um, and, and we're never lacking uh, information and resources there. Uh, but what I will say in relation to COVID and the pandemic, uh, we really built out a few of those sections to focus on particularly emergency funding relief, uh, COVID-19 specific relief. Uh, and this again could come from different third party sources. So it could be here locally, um, but it also expands statewide uh, and federally as well. Um, we are working in partnership with Fund for the Arts, who is a coalition of different local foundations on a technology assessment project. Uh, I think we'll talk about this a lot today. Mary Ellie even mentioned earlier that the responses to the survey, uh, a lot of you have focused on technology needs, equipment. Uh, we will be uh, going through and doing an assessment of that because we would like to put together uh, all of your thoughts and ideas. You know, what do you need as far as whether it could be uh, marketing and promotion, training of staff, specific equipment, um, really getting into those details because as we move forward, I know a lot of organizations pivoted to virtual programming. However, we're going into this phase where a lot of us are in that middle ground. Uh, maybe we're doing hybrid, both in-person and virtual, um, but I do uh, I do see the trends going to that. You, you know, We learned a lot through the pandemic, having to go virtual, we gained a lot of skill sets, and so we wanna make sure that organizations can continue to maximize on those skill sets and not just leave virtual behind and move fully into in-person. Um, I, I think there's a lot of lessons that organizations can learn from that. So. If you are interested in sharing your thoughts and ideas in regards to what you need for equipment and technology needs moving forward, uh, you can email uh, myself, uh, jen at asiwny.org, um, or we have our info email that's up on this slide. Uh, email that uh, requesting your participation and we'll, we'll add you into that process. Uh, we've also been uh, focusing on advocacy and information sharing related to uh, COVID and any changes there. Particularly, we've been really active on the statewide level. Uh, I am on the board of directors of a, a statewide group called Arts New York State, and that's really um, to look at the state budget, uh, particularly in relation to the New York State Council on the Arts and their funding and their budget. Um, Many organizations on this call uh, probably already get direct uh, New York State Council on the Arts funding. Uh, some of you may get indirect New York State Council on the Arts funding uh, through ASI, through our, our DEC uh, funding program. Uh, in, in relation to those, um, we've really been working to make sure that as we move forward in 2022 and beyond, that uh, the State Arts Council budget uh, remains intact. And um, we also know that there's been conversations in relation to the American Rescue Plan and those funds in particular. So we're just making sure that all of our regions of the state are being represented. Uh, same thing with PPE access, uh, anything that any organizations need. Uh, recently, we were able to get um, some bulk information orders uh, out to the field. Uh, really, we are being flexible and uh, fluid with whatever you are telling us. So if 10 organizations come to us and say, we need X in particular, we're really looking at how we can shape our services and resources to help you out there. And so that ties in with whether it's one-on-one -on -one general support, um, or our group workshop settings. We've been doing a lot of virtual professional development discussions on reopening. Some of you remember we did a four, four part series over, uh, over the summer about reopening. Um, we may need to do that again, uh, as the county executive mentioned earlier, you know, there's, there's new and, and oncoming changes. And so we just wanna make sure that we're being responsive to that. Um, the, the last thing that I will add is that um, we're also hosting, uh, we've been having smaller reopening uh, task force groups. Uh, where we have three different uh, groups. One is uh, small, uh, small uh, budget organizations, midsize and then large organizations. And we've been having these smaller discussions about reopening what each uh, organization is going through, how each organization can learn from each other. And those have been really useful because instead of the large, you know, 100 to 200 attendee kind of open forum, 
uh, public workshops, uh, we've been able to just kind of talk one on one and do some hands on work with some organizations. So also, if your organization wants to be involved in any of those discussions, those are open to anyone um, that wants to join uh, in those conversations as well. And I'll just close before I turn it over to Mary Ellie. I'll close and just say, you know, I think based on um, the three speakers that that we just had in this portion of the town hall, um, many of you may have have known a lot of this information already, but I think what's really important is, you know, what's the next step? What happens after this? So many of you uh, may already be in tune to uh, a lot of these resources. What comes after this? You know, how does this evolve into 2022, 2023, right? What does this look like after these immediate uh, emergency relief efforts come into play? Um, and before I pass it over to Mar Mary Ellie, I do want to mention, I, I love that Dr. Burstein uh, mentioned the vaccination events, and I'm not sure if she's still on or not, but uh, something interesting that I thought of was on behalf of the field, um, mentioning these events and activities. Uh, I'm just curious to know um, if an arts and cultural organization would want to host a vaccination event or do some sort of partnership there, how would they be able to go about uh, doing that? Hi, I'm Gail. I haven't left you yet. Uh, um, thank you for that question. Uh, you can um, send um, my um, assistant an email, Megan Lavin, um, or if you have, you know, whosever email you have, or Kara Kane, our public information officer, and, uh, you know, submit your proposal, your idea, and we can talk about it. We are up for anything right now. So thank you. Thank you for your willingness to help. Great. Thank you for that. And uh, and I'm all set, so I will I will turn it over to Mary Ellie. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Dr. Burstein. There was a couple questions in the chat I was wondering if I could bring up at this point before um, to either yourself or to uh, Director Delaney. One of the questions was, could you uh, clarify on remaining limits on museums slash art organizations, especially are tours still limited to only members of a single household are all restrictions lifted except for limits on overall capacity? Um, uh, New York forward is very confusing at this point. Definitely a Jen Delaney question. <laughs> good, good afternoon. So in general, the capacity limits on all businesses have been removed. However, the caveat to that is that you can only increase your capacity to where you can ensure that your visitors will, can maintain six feet of social distancing. So what does that actually mean? It's a little confusing and hard for some places to, to come up with a number, um, but you don't want to fill your building to 100% capacity because you won't be able to necessarily maintain that six foot distancing. Um, as far as tours um, go, you could open it up to additional members, um, to, to groups that aren't from the same household. However, um, in those particular cases, um, you know, definitely mask use would be a recommendation and you still would want the parties to maintain some distance from each other and not just kind of group and stand right on top of each other while um, being part of that tour. Thank and if you. I can, if I can add, of course. Uh, under the new guidance from New York State, it says that facilities can go 100% capacity and not have the six foot restriction, but you must confirm that everyone is vaccinated. So, as you may have heard, Radio City Music Hall has announced that they will be having 100% attendance uh, at their shows starting this summer. However, they are going to confirm that every attendee is vaccinated. So, you do have the ability of, of dropping the six foot separation guideline, but you then have to confirm that every attendee on any day, uh, any show, whatever the organization must is, uh, has been vaccinated. Otherwise you gotta drop down to the six foot standard. So as a result, uh, what I've heard is uh, quite a number of organizations are still having the limitations uh, based on the six foot standard. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to hear of some that uh, allow 100% capacity, but then we'll have to confirm count uh, vaccination, meaning they would be excluding uh, those who are unvaccinated. So there, there is a a, a a requirement that if you uh, do drop your uh, capacity, or I should say you 
you uh, you drop the six foot uh, social distancing requirement, you can uh, go 100%, but you've got a lot more responsibility in ensuring that everybody who walks in the doors is vaccinated. Thank you. I have a follow, a sort of follow up, but not quite question. Uh, someone asked if there are any county recommendations on how businesses and organizations should respond to the governor's mandate that starting tomorrow, vaccinated persons do not need to wear masks indoors. Actually, the county will be uh, issuing a statement soon with regards to employees as well as uh, invitees. Uh, we are requiring for the time being until we can see a higher percentage of vaccination numbers in Erie County that every one of the guests invitees into our buildings wear a mask. We do not want to have to confirm at the door that people are have vaccination proof. Uh, we are also requiring employees that are even vaccinated for the time being uh, to wear masks in public positions, public facing roles if they're dealing directly with the public or walking through our hallways. Uh, they don't necessarily have to wear a mask if they're uh, in their office or having a meeting with someone else who also was vaccinated. We're going to be going probably to a system where we can confirm who's vaccinated and not, uh, but we don't have those numbers just yet. Uh, as a private entity, you have the ability to require a, a stricter strand standard. Uh, what the CDC said is those that are vaccinated no longer need to wear masks. Except in certain settings, they have to. So there's still issues associated with those that are vaccinated and would be congregate settings. Uh, but if you have a lot of people in a, a small location in a short, in a small period of time, and they're vaccinated and unvaccinated, you could have transmission. Maybe not to the vaccinated folks, but there's a there is a concern that uh, the the thought that everyone can get rid of masks and it's safe. It's not the case. We still feel because we know that there's new cases every day in Erie County. Uh, and on average, we're we're having two deaths a day in the last uh, two weeks, so we're still seeing deaths in Erie County. It's just not as bad as it was. Uh, I don't know, doctor, if you want to add anything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's really you know what you feel most comfortable with uh, keeping that maintaining the safety of your staff. And your patrons or your your uh, you know, your clients, and also, I mean, there's really a perception thing. So you want people that walk into through your doors to feel safe. And so, if more people are mass, um, especially staff, um, and there are other preventive measures um, still in place, I think you know people feel more comfortable uh, coming to your venue as a you know as, as a safe place where where uh, you know they can go for uh, for entertainment. Um, so, you know, you can always pull back. Um, however, you know, right now we're not at a place where, you know, we ha we're at all near her herd immunity. And so, uh, you know, the, uh, the CDC and the state are providing the minimum. And so, um, you know, you can uh, take on, you know, more preventive measures as a policy, you know, in your own businesses for, uh, you know, again, to protect um, yourselves, um, your, your employees, uh, your patrons and, and clients. And I know also as um, be viewed as a safe place for uh, for people to come in the community. I do have and one you, more uh, sorry, question. Sorry, I also suggest you know you you. It's I mean it's maybe on these weekly calls that we have we can like talk amongst ourselves and you know people can figure out you know what what everybody else is doing so there can be a, a new community standard. I have uh, one more question uh, in the chat. I know you folks need to leave soon, uh, but I think this one is best answered now. What plans, if any, are there for increasing county funding for cultural? We will uh, go through the general process that we always have with regards to uh, operational as well as uh, capital requests. Uh, at this time, I. We're not even in a position to be thinking about the 2022 budget. Uh, so I would suggest that all entities, and I know the 2022 process has started for culturals and the submission period uh, will be moving is moving forward. But when it comes to the county, uh, I it's much too early to be considering any conversation with regards to 2022. Uh, we made major cuts in most lines of uh, 
the 2021 budget, except for arts and cultural institutions. I, I kept them at the same level they were the prior year, even though many other departments in Erie County government were substantially cut. Uh, so for now, I, I can't say anything other than uh, if organizations are seeking additional funding, they should go through the, the proper mechanisms that we have in place. And uh, that'll go through the cultural arts board. It would eventually come to uh, Department of Environment and Planning. They'll make a submission to my office. Uh, my office will make its final budget recommendation, which will go to the legislature, and then the legislature uh, makes the will we'll vote on my proposal. Sometimes amending it, uh, but uh, in general, working with my office on ensuring we have a fair process in place. And I see our chairwoman, legislator April Baskin, is on. Uh, I, I know we we ought. Offered you an opportunity earlier, Chairwoman Baskin, to say a few words. I'm not certain if you uh, want to say some, but if you do, the floor is yours right now. April might be taking care of Josiah, which was one of Erie County's newest uh, uh, residents, born last year. So <laughs> it's been quite a few of. Uh, uh, WebEx meetings in which uh, I know she had a run to take care of her little ones, so perhaps that's what's going on right now. But uh, so for the 2022 process, we are we are far away from any uh, any numbers and figuring out where we are. Uh, I will note that we, we had a question come in earlier about the American Rescue Plan funding uh, that cannot be used for arts and cultural institutions. Uh, it could have been used to fill gaps that were created as a result of COVID if. If we had cut you by 20%, then we could have theoretically used the American Rescue Plan funding to fill those gaps, but considering there was no cuts, the American Rescue Plan funding cannot be used it for it. And then when it comes to uh, capital, uh, it specifically notes that American Rescue Plan funds can only be used for uh, sewer, water, and broadband projects through the county. Uh, so we cannot use American Rescue Plan funds for uh, capital projects that uh, a particular entity may be proposing. Uh, the American Rescue Plan funds were primarily, as it pertains to county dollars, it was for COVID-19 response, vaccine delivery, offsetting any uh, uh, financial revenue shortfalls that we had, which were substantial, and then the water sewer and, and broadband projects. So, uh, it's a, there's a lot of money that Erie County has received, but uh, right off the bat, a substantial amount of that offsets our, our revenue loss, which affects us. And we're able to return back to employment, jobs that we cut, and, and services that we cut. Uh, however, when it comes to arts and cultural institutions, they were not cut. They were not reduced from the 2020 allocation, so they don't qualify for American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, as it pertains to 2021 funding. I have a few questions still in the chat regarding um, vaccination and stuff like that. I know you folks have um, had another commitment, but I'll just carry on with the question. Uh, do you have a recommend? Uh, oh, wait, my question. Is it true that all performers and staff must be vaccinated or have a negative COVID test within 72 hours? And do you have a recommendation for a database or app for venues to collect vaccination info from patrons should we need to supply that data? Um, sorry, can you ask, can you repeat the first part of the question? Is it true that all performers and staff must be vaccinated or have a negative COVID test within 72 hours? Jen, do you want to take that? Yes. Um, so, two seconds. Um, oh, goodness gracious. I believe it does say yes. So, for all talent um, performers and public facing employees, they must have a sample result, either a PCR within 72 hours of the performance or event start time, or a rapid test within six hours of the 
uh, performance or event start time and that or proof of vaccination. Um, Jen, you know, it may be helpful if um, you can, you know, put the link to those guidance in the chat box and then, you know, people can, um, you know, can read the guidance and then at our first Q&A, we can ask, you can ask some other questions that the guidance hasn't already answered for you. I know, because um, I'm not sure if people have been able to read the guidance. I know they're kind of new. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, the other question was uh, for vaccination requirements. Is there a required standard at this point as to how to prove vaccination? Well, I think the um, most uh, uh, valid and credible source of information is by uh, looking at the Excelsior, the New York State Excelsior Pass. So. Uh, if you know, you can re um, require that uh, you know patrons and staff download the pass, and uh, it will have all their uh, their updated vaccination data if they are fully vaccinated. So I mean that um, we know that unfortunately that you know um, there are these the CDC issues uh, vac vaccination cards to document people's first and second doses. Unfortunately, there are counterfeit cards out there, and people can lose their cards if they really were vaccinated, then they wouldn't have the evidence. So I think the Associated Pass is uh, is really relies on the New York State Inform Immunization Information System. So it's um, so that is you know documented uh, it, um, electronic health records that show that a person is fully vaccinated and they'll only able to get the the Excelsior pass if they are fully vaccinated. Thank you very much and thank you both for uh, Dr. Bursting and County Executive for being here. I know you only have a few minutes till your next commitment. Um, we kind of wrapped up the questions being uh, more specific to this section. So I think I will, we were kind of having a discussion, but I think I'll open it up more. Um, and to kind of open that session, we were uh, going to start with some speakers from specific organizations to open it up. Uh, let me move them real quick. Dan Hart would be first from uh, President of an ex and Executive Director of the BPO. We'll then have Musical Fair Theater Artistic and Executive Director Randall Kramer uh, speaking uh, on some of the experiences of the mid-size organizations and then Buffalo, Alma Carrillo from Buffalo Art Studios Executive Director uh, to speak on some of the challenges and opportunities the um, smaller organizations have had. And then we'll open it up more at that point and I'll give some directions for everyone to join in there. Uh, Dan, are you yeah. here? Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, uh, I, you may not be able to see me, but you can hear me. But uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, address the group. And uh, I enjoyed the, the information that was shared in the, the first half. I, I guess just in terms of uh, uh, kind of talking about how COVID has impacted uh, the art sector and the, the BPO and Klein Hands in particular, uh, I, I guess I first would want to say that um, it really uh, a saving grace, you know, is the safety net of government support. And we, we owe a lot to our county and to our state and to our federal government for giving us the funds to get through this. I, I'm not for sure that we would make it in the way that we did had it not been for those um, that kind of vote in confidence and that safety net of funding that has kind of sustained us. So, um, you know, I've very, been very impressed with uh, County Executive Pulling Cars. Uh, Gail Burstein and her staff have just been great at every turn and uh, giving us guidance throughout the past year. So I, I feel very fortunate. Uh, and from a financial standpoint, uh, you know, that's this is the second big crisis that we've been through uh, during my time here, almost 20 years. Uh, in 2009, the Great Recession hit us hard, and I was for sure that there was nothing else in my lifetime that would, uh, you know, have the same kind of impact uh, as that. And when the pandemic started out, you know, we kind of were thinking, well, this feels a little bit like 2009. And then quickly after a couple of months, we realized that it was much worse uh, and, and that the impact would be much more substantial and ongoing. So, um, you know, I think we we, uh, we have survived. Um, after 14 months, uh, many of you know that we are 
back open. We're playing for audiences again. In April, we were playing for houses of 50 to 75 people. Uh, now we're playing for about 200 people. We are uh, requiring vaccination proof or COVID proof for everyone who comes through our doors. Uh, we test our musicians twice a week. So uh, I, I feel like we've got a, a safe place, but every week it's a different, uh, you know, something else comes along that we're going to have to adjust to. And, uh, you know, I, I think that this is one of the, I don't know, great learning um, outcomes of the COVID is that, you know, we have all found in ourselves, not just the BPO, but many of the groups represented here, the uh, ingenuity and resilience uh, to get through times like this by just, you know, adapting and because we have no other choice. So, uh, you know, uh, BPO is going to be okay. Client hands is going to be okay. Um, thanks to the government support. And, you know, I guess a couple of the things that I've learned that are just so important in ongoing operations are just uh, keeping in touch with our constituents. You know, our, our donors stepped up in a way that we haven't seen uh, in a long time uh, because they care about our institutions. And I think that's something that we need to remember. Uh, whether you're a big or small organization, you're important to this community. You have a fan base, you have constituency constituents that want to support you. So communication and appreciation for them is like at the top of my mind right now. Um, but we're really looking forward to, you know, the fall kind of getting back to normal, um, making sense of, of, of everything that's happening. We're, we're, uh, it has just been so exciting to see our audiences again. So. We're, we're going to forge ahead and um, I, I hope everyone else is in the same boat and looking forward to better days. So thank you for the opportunity to address the group. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Next we have um, Randall Kramer. Let's see. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You're all set. Go for it. I cannot see me, but I will trust that's hearing is plenty. Um, uh, I have to, you know, to second a lot of what Dan said, uh, we've had tremendous uh, government support in the form of PPP. Uh, that has been really incredibly helpful. Uh, of course, the support Erie County continuing its funding um, uh, was exemplary uh, during these times. And again, was something that was very, very important. Uh, I won't go into great detail about us other than to talk a little bit about musical fair because we're a little bit of a larger midsize, but probably many of the things we've done um, and we've had to deal with are what other midsize organizations had to deal with. So we had to cancel the last two productions in our 2019, 2020 season. Um, we had to cancel, of course, all of our 2020, 21 season. And just to give you a, an idea of what that does for ticket sales, uh, ticket sales in 2018, 2019 were 923,000 uh, uh, and change. That was reduced to 673,000 in 2019, 2020. That's because we had a very successful season until we had to cancel the last two. This year, because all we've been able to do is virtual cabaret ticket sales, it's less than 50,000. So 923 to less than 50. Um, that's the impact that it's had on us. When it comes to earned revenue, specifically ticket sales, um, what have we done? Uh, much like the BPO, much like a lot of organizations, we have gone virtual since April of 2020. We've done 17 live stream performances of jazz, Broadway artists, musical tributes, uh, nine Zoom roundtables with directors, choreographers, designers, cast, musicians, BIPOC, BIPOC actors talking about inclusion and equity. Uh, we've done uh, video productions of uh, a musical Swing, Swing, Swing and Stories of Life. All told, about 8,000 people have attended these. Uh, and now, considering our cabaret uh, capacity is 97, we've actually exceeded the capacity by quite a lot with these virtual productions. Uh, we've had people from all over New York State, of course, but also 30 other states um, and uh, four or five different provinces in Canada and two other foreign countries. Um, that have that have purchased tickets and and watched these virtual uh, this virtual programming. Uh, we when we are producing, we have over a hundred people a year that we employ, actors and designers, but we only have six full time staff, administrative staff, I guess I should say, mostly administrative, some production. Uh, we've kept them on through all of this. 
uh, from the very beginning. Uh, we've kept them on full time. Uh, again, a lot of that is thanks to the support uh, of the federal government, thanks to the support of Erie County, uh, and also to echo Dan, uh, thanks to the support of our donors and corporate um, supporters. Uh, we set a record last year for um, individual giving. Um, and this year we are three months away from the end of our fiscal year and we've already broken that record. Um, so the support has been tremendous. Um, we are looking right now, uh, Dan was talking about the BPO going back to live performances. We have been doing some test case, beta case, um, beta test case uh, cabarets. Um, we did two of them last weekend to socially distant um, um, uh, audiences and you know we've cut our from our 97 capacity of cabaret it's down to closer to 30. Um, we will we are looking at um, coming back onto the main stage toward the end of June um, and what we're looking at right now is requiring uh, we'll be doing five performances a week requiring for four of those performances that all audiences uh, have been vaccinated uh, and then for one audience, one performance per week, we will do a socially distant performance. Uh, and that way, not only can vaccinated people still come, but also non vaccinated people uh, could come so that we can maintain the various uh, guidelines, CDC guidelines that, that we have to do. Um, so that's where we stand. Um, and, um, you know, like everybody else, every day uh, is a new adventure uh, in this in this COVID world. And we look forward to um, to moving past it in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. And now we will have Alma Carrillo. Let's see if I can get you on. Please let me know if you can hear me and speak. There we go. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I also want to thank Erie County for keeping their financial commitments and for supporting our work, even through the hardest of times. So thank you so much. Um, the effect of the pandemic on smaller to mid-sized organizations in Buffalo vary greatly. Successes and losses depended on the kinds of programming the organizations conduct, the organization's revenue streams, the pre-existing technological infrastructure, and the size of the staff. At Buffalo Art Studio, we were luckier than most and I will speak to our experiences in the past year. Buffalo Art Studio adapted quickly to COVID closures and restrictions to minimize the negative impact of the pandemic. Thanks to our funders that, and by strategically pivoting administratively, programmatically, and technologically, we were able to maintain fiscal stability while actively engaging our community. Buffalo Art Studio adapted quickly to COVID closures. Being small helped us be nimble. We quickly transported, transformed a new fundraiser we have been working for nine months into a successful mobile auction with 700 artworks and 500 ticket holders bidding from across the country. Our education director personally reached out to our Jumpstart middle uh, students and high school students to serve them their interests in synchronous classes as well as their internet and equipment access. And by April, 21 students had been, um, had been hand delivered their own set of art supplies and had started weekly programming with artist Julia Bottoms. We shifted our, um, you know, to featuring artists working from home uh, by May and by, um, and we were offering uh, monthly events online by uh, quickly after that. By July, we had started three site specific public art projects and we had reopened Buffalo Art Studio to the public with new safety protocols that allow in person youth workshops in a full schedule of exhibition programs that was responsive to all, um, to all that was happening around us. We also focus on supporting our artist community by finding them paid opportunities inside and outside Buffalo Art Studio, raising our hourly teaching wage and adding more paid prep time for virtual offerings, extending uh, studio run support and connecting artists to emergency help. We also work alongside other organizations and groups, specifically frontline spots Frontline Arts Buffalo to advocate for equitable emergency artist financial support that was easier to access and more comprehensive. All the success did come at a price for such a small organization like Buffalo Art Studio. Heavier workloads and higher levels of stress. Our small staff had to work hundreds of additional hours over the past year to keep up with the growing needs of our community, to meet the demands, 
to research and learn new skills for virtual and mobile events, and the recreating of programming a number of times as protocols change. Oh, and of course, the applying of emergency funds, the numerous pivoting plan reports to funders, the end of grant reporting, um, you know, all the different scenario budgets we had to create. There was no time off for us. The work-life grew exponentially this past year. Like many other organizations, our small staff had to balance caring for small family members and, um, and also other family members to, uh, while working. This was serving families and communities with often greater needs and more barriers to access help. Because the staff staff is so small, I'm one of four and the only full-time staff, the staff pushed through the stress to continue providing a safe space to engage in dialogue and positive change, especially as social unrest grew. We do find a number of areas of opportunity. Our successes over the past year have been due primarily to the strong personal relationships and the quick pivoting of our small organization. Although we appreciate growing national and international audience thanks to our virtual events, our excitement has been seeing a new or renewed appreciation for handmade original objects and hands-on experiences. People are willing to invest and support makers they know and to become makers themselves. To meet the demand, we have expanded our spring and summer class, class offerings, and we continue to open our galleries five days a week. Another area of opportunity is the building of grad school's power and equity within the arts. We are one of the least diverse professions. This year showed us that even at the hardest times, power can be built to elevate everyone, especially frontline populations. There is a growing community of allies ready to stand in solidarity, to mobilize financially and through actions around issues and organizations they care about. We have seen changes, sometimes driven or supported by government officials, and we have some here. Um, thank you. Um, this is also a time to end an internalized uh, scarcity mentality within small size organizations doing grassroots work, which is often reflected in low salaries and benefits. Doing a lot with very little has almost been a batch of honor for many of us. We need to raise awareness of the needs of smaller organizations, especially those serving frontline communities, to reflect the diversity of the region and the arts. With better compensation, since, it's only, since only this will happen, um, the diversity, uh, we will grow the diversity of the community if we open opportunities to those without other financial safety nets. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. Okay, so at this point, I think we're now back on schedule, basically. I will um, try to unmute everyone so that you have the option to mute and unmute yourself. Um, please do mute yourself if you don't intend to speak right away, just so we don't have a lot of background noise. Uh, the, let's see, let me just try it now. Say an example. Say an example. If you are, you may unmute yourself. I have a little bit of 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 Control. Just you say three times. You say five times. I said, Oh, mom, oh, mom, into the sink. All right. So, what we're going to try is to we're going to try is to use the raise hand option. Okay. It should be hand in your lower right hand corner somewhere. Hand in corner somewhere. And I will uh, take I will, some, or uh, some, some of the questions that were in the chat and then we'll bang the we can raise hand so everyone can join the discussion. Join the discussion. Okay. So I'm going to try to mute myself as well. Okay. 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 The one question I the had, one question um, I had in the chat um, that I want to bring up. That I want to bring up. As soon as 
if I stop hearing my own echo. Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, uh, the question was, oh, um, okay, here we go. It was a comment that the Excelsior Pass had not been functioning. Um, and while a lot of their staff were fully vaccinated for many weeks, but have been unable to get the token. Do you have any info on that, Ken, by any chance? Um, I do not. I know that um, they said it can take some time for the information to be in Excelsior Pass. Also, dependent on where the vaccinations occurred, um, if it wasn't a county facility, they should check back and ensure that the information was put into um, NICES so that it can be accessed by the Excelsior Pass. Okay. Mary Ellie. Uh, this is Randy yes. Kramer. Just a quick note. Uh, mm -hmm. During a staff meeting we had the other day, one of my staff was able to get the pass in three minutes online, and I was just able to do it while we were in this meeting. Um, and I know people have had problems, but I do think that uh, it is working more times than not. And so it might be a good time to go back and try it again. Okay. I will follow up with the person who posted the question. Let's see if there's any particular issue. I saw um, Amy, I believe it was. Amy Steiner, you go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. So um, currently, um, I'm the conductor and music director of the Buffalo Nighter Concert Band, and we are on a big project for 2022 with the Philharmonic Chorus. And um, we have to put a lot of money down for that project at Klein Hands Music Hall. The problem is, is that we can't fit in our rehearsal space, uh, the Buffalo Niger concert band inside, um, in order to, in, in order to rehearse, um, because the band has been off, obviously this whole time, um, they're going to need regular, regular rehearsals. So what I'm asking is, does anyone have any idea in Erie County? Um, that would have a space big enough to hold musicians temporarily to rehearse. And we are a not for profit, so we really don't have money to rent a facility large enough. Right now, we can hold 45 of our 80 musicians um, socially distant. Okay. Um, I Amy, mean, did you say an indoor space or just a space? Big enough for 80 musicians? We would need indoor when it starts raining. We start rehearsals uh, next Wednesday outside, but once we hit rain and then once the fall comes, I mean, obviously we have to take it week by week, month by month. However, we, I don't, I don't know if it, I don't know if we're crazy planning this big 200 musician world premiere concert at Klein Hands Music Hall, which is costing us a lot of money um, without having a rehearsal space inside. We we definitely cannot fit inside once we we have rain outside or in the fall when we just can't rehearse out there anymore. So I'm asking, <clears throat> and I know it's a big shot in the dark, but can Erie County provide some sort of large area for 80 musicians to be socially distant so that we can give our musicians that carrot at the end of the stick in 2022. I don't know, just asking. I think 80 musicians might be, to remain socially distant, I think it might be too large, but Someone uh, suggested maybe the second floor of the central library. So we can, you might want to double check with them. And um, I think some of the park structures might be, they're pretty large inside, but I'm not sure that they're 80 musicians large. However, I think we can keep that in mind unless you know of anywhere, Tom or Jane. Down well, I, I'm thinking there may be, um... I don't know, maybe space at one of the community colleges. I mean, one of the large uh, um, classrooms spaces or, uh, you know, theater spaces. There. Um, there might be some space at uh, 
I, I, we would have to look into it and uh you know definitely would any of the um organizations on the call that might have us uh, have ideas or have a space uh to offer should you know should let us know too but um we could look into uh, potential county spaces um for, and and get back to somebody but um i mean we do have county you know plenty of county spaces that would hold that that number of people so um at our community colleges at our uh, fire training center maybe um I, I don't know how appropriate or you know that that kind of space is but um that we could definitely look into that that, that would be fantastic because um, I, I don't even know where to begin I, without saying, you know, like we cannot, we won't even survive paying rent weekly at all for this if we had to do that. Right now, we're, we're already paying rent where we rehearse currently. So I don't, we're just looking for help in that area. <clears throat> I believe someone also mentioned office space out of Asbury Hall. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. That might be another option. Um, hi, this is Yuki from Buffalo String Works, and we rent space out of Asbury Hall for our offices. But um, you know, I'm sure people on this hall have been to Asbury Hall Babeville, so there's a very, very big performance space here. It, um, unfortunately, I'm quite sure that the landlord would not be able to do it at no cost. But if there's a way that um, you know some funding could be, um, you know, uh, he's very, very accommodating to to small nonprofits. So I think it's worth a conversation, and um, I'd be happy to try to make that connection. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. If you just um, reach out to me at Buffalo String Works, um, I'd be, you know, we can go from there. Um, can I have your email quick? Yes, I'm having some trouble figuring out how to write to everybody. Um, but yes, it's Yuki, Y-U-K-I at buffalostringworks.org. I seem to only be able to chat I think presenters and hosts at this point. I apologize for everyone having to listen to me give out my email. <laughs> and then how would that, I, um, thanks, Yuki. How would I how could people follow up with me if they have any ideas? Mary Ellie. Uh why don't you email send me your email in the chat and I'll put it out for everyone to contact you if they have uh some resources for you. Thank you so so much, everyone. So this is a now more open discussion session, listening session. We have representatives here from Visit Buffalo Niagara, Cindy Kincaid, uh, Director of Industry Relations. We have Clotilde Perez Bode de Decker, Executive Director of Community Foundation of Greater Buffalo. And I know we have some members of uh, Fun for the Arts in the audience. We have, of course, Jen Flaw and Kilpatrick and Holly Grant from ASI that spoke a little earlier. We have Lori. Chefchek, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, <laughs> from the ECIDA, uh, Director of Grants. We have Karen Helmerson from uh, NISCA to hear, listen in as well. And um, we have Director of Environmental Health for Erie County's Department of Health, Jennifer Delaney. We have Graham Smith, the Chair of the Erie County Arts and Cultural Advisory Board. And we have more of the members as well in the audience. And then you have me, Social Suspect, and Tom Hershey, Commissioner of Environment and Planning. If you have any questions, uh, if you have questions for the representatives or uh, others of, uh, from the sector, um, please feel free to share. If you have a statement you want to make, feel free to share. Use your uh, raise hand option on the bottom right, I believe, of your uh, screen. And we will call on you. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. I think hopefully, but just so we don't get too much background and um, rebound noise. Thank you.
Does anyone have any questions? I know many of you wanted to make sure you had a time to speak up. This is it. If you're having difficulties on muting yourself, please just let me know in the chat, me or David, and we can uh, set up your sound to unmute, I believe. Mary Ellie, I, I know I'm, uh, I'm not necessarily an audience member, but I do have a question actually about the Excelsior, if somebody knows. Um, is that on, does that only carry New York State uh, vaccination? So as long as you were vaccinated within the state of New York, it's in there. If you came from Ohio or Pennsylvania and you happened to be in town and wanted to attend an event, would your vaccination show up in Excelsior unless you've registered with Excelsior? Just, just sort of wondering. I personally do not know. Do you know, Jen? I don't know off the top of my head. I will see if I can find out. This is uh, Leanne Grace from Buffalo Opera Unlimited. I attended the NISCA session on um, on the Excelsior Pass, and there was, in fact, discussion about them collaborating with other states. They were going to start with the nearby states of Connecticut and New Jersey and work out from there. But how far out they are at this point, you know, obviously, I don't know. Any other questions, uh, concerns, comments? I know it's a little unfortunate that we have to do this over WebEx instead of uh, in person, which is always the best way to have these sort of conversations. Uh, we had the group that was kind of putting this together, most of which are pretty much everyone else, which is here in the uh, the panelist uh, screen, wanted to know what you want um, funders to keep in mind going forward. Go ahead, Yuki. Thank you. Hi, this is Yuki again from Buffalo Stringworks. Um, I said this on a call last week with a group that the Cullen Foundation had gathered together. And I just wanted to mention in this arena that I think mental health and um, wellness is a significant issue that I would encourage all of us um, in the arts as well as the funders to be thinking about very carefully. and. What we're seeing as an educational institution is that the, the communities that we're serving, the young people, particularly middle school, high school students are really suffering. Several of our students have been in crisis mode, which has prompted um, our staff, which are, and we're primarily musicians, to be taking mental health first aid training and, and doing our best to really sort of essentially put bandages on the situation. However, you know, I worry a lot about not only our students and families, but also those of us who have been doing the serving and have not stopped during the pandemic and what those long term effects may be on on those of us who kept pushing and pushing and continue to do this work. So um, what I think that means in a concrete way for an organization, which is as small as Buffalo Streamworks, is that we're thinking very carefully about, um, you know, that potentially bringing on a social worker or counselors to really take over that side of the, the service that we offer. Because as I said, as trained musicians and educators, uh, mental health and wellness is not our area of expertise. 
However, I, I just, I guess I mentioned this to funders to be really thinking about because it may look like mission drift. It may look, you may wonder why an arts organization is looking for that, but it is because we have built these relationships with our families who are now more comfortable coming to us sometimes than going to a school or going to their doctor. So I just wanted to put that out there um, for consideration in this forum. So thank you very much. Yuki, I think that brings up an excellent point of um, just more general operating support and unrestricted dollars because things like this do happen and they often happen in between funding cycles um, or in between program cycles and with more unrestricted dollars, um, our organizations will be better positioned to pivot um, to respond to situations like that, whether it's bringing on a staff member or bringing in trainings um, and things like that. But when when so much of our dollars are restricted to specific program support, it's harder to pivot and respond to the need of the community in a, in a fast way. Absolutely. And thank you so much for articulating that. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. And I'm Amelia from Young Audiences. I forgot to say that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I do, I do have an, another question, um, not related to funders, um, and, and I don't know if this is a, a concern for others, but um, are there any discussions or, or hesitations or concerns about um, HIPAA and medical privacy laws when it comes to asking people for vaccination records, um, whether it's staff or the public? Um, I, you know, I don't know much about HIPAA other than what it stands for and why it exists. Um, so I just wasn't sure if there's anything that as organizations, especially any organization that works with public facing customers or, or clients that we should be aware of when it comes to how to ask for vaccination proof or proof of a recent COVID test, those types of things. Well, I'll jump in here. It's Randy Kramer again from Musical Fair, and I am not an attorney, but I am married to one, um, and I know lots of them. Um, my understanding is that because this is not a pre-existing condition, um, you can, as Mark said, uh, you can require uh, your employees and you can require your audiences to be vaccinated if that is what you deem necessary to do. Great. Thanks, Randy. I appreciate it. Hi, this is Christiana. Just jumping on what um, that gentleman just said. It's it's important to understand that HIPAA and all of those other laws that you are referencing regulate what that doctor and your healthcare provider can do with your health information. It does not apply to what you, as a private person, wants to do with your health information. So those laws don't prevent them from giving it to you or you asking it directly of that person. That law is about your doctor not being able to give out that information. Awesome, thank you. Hi, this is Alma, um, just following up on the same point. What if they're minors? I mean, just following the same as Christiana again, following the same things we just said. I mean, whether a minor or an adult, you're still asking that, you know, that minor's a guardian directly for that information. So again, whatever rules that would apply for you to be able to ask that adult would be the same asking that adult on behalf of who they are a guardian of. Um, I don't, again, not a lawyer, but I, I don't think that any of those laws would preclude or prevent you from asking for that information as you would ask of an adult. Um, Kate Loconte, see so you have your hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, this is Kate Loconte Alxer from Irish Classical Theatre Company. And just a question about the updates to the guidelines as they will likely come through in the next weeks and months moving into 
next year. Is there a resource or could we be pointed to a, a resource to check in on updates as they come, any sort of notifications or um, any communication that will go out as updates are made? Or is it, um, of course, our responsibility to go back and, and check frequently, but is there any sort of like continuous notification communication that can come out? Thank you. Jennifer Delaney from the health department. We aren't currently sending out notifications, uh, mainly because there are um, many different groups that we are currently, you know, trying to assist with getting um, some help on the guidance documents. Um, and we're not currently sending out notification on those. I can tell you that um, the New York forward website is the best place to get updated guidance information. Um, a lot of the information also does come through the governor's press conferences um, when he has those. And if you have specific questions, you can always email us at large events at erie.gov and we will get back to you as quickly as we can. Wonderful. Thank you. If you have any questions or comments, concerns, now is your chance. Uh, either unmute yourself or use the raise hand function. We can uh, go back and forth between topics. Um, like if you want to ask something specific of the health department or ACIDA, we can jump back and forth to that. But we can, we were asking as well, um, what do you want funders to keep in mind going forward? Whether to 2022 or even this year or long term. Uh, I see a hand, Leanne Grace. This is Leanne Grace from Buffalo Opera Unlimited. We were incredibly grateful to our funders, those who could um, be flexible in terms of how we used our funding uh, as we needed to move from live performance to virtual. And I think that as we attempt to re-engage with our audiences, there are a lot of unknowns for us. How quickly, how easily we're going to be able to um, bring people back into the um, into the theater uh, or into an outdoor space, and. I think that flexibility is going to be required for a while. Um, audience numbers are one of the most common measures that funders look at in terms of your success. And I think that this next year is going to be very iffy for all of us. And so at least in the short term, um, some flexibility uh, in terms of how those numbers count, I think will be quite important. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Heather? Hello, Heather, can you, are you hear me? Oh, yes, go ahead. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so my name is Heather Gring and I'm here representing uh, Locust Street Arts and Frontline Arts Buffalo. And I wanted to first um, thank everyone at the county for creating this space to talk today. I think this is a really awesome model to allow us all to talk together and really you know, uh, collaboratively uh, brainstorm and see how we can figure out how we can all move forward together. I think, um, so as a board member of Locust Street Arts, um, 
you know, I, I do find it interesting that uh, you consider Buffalo Art Studio to be a small arts organization. Um, they're an incredible arts organization that is quite a bit bigger than some frontline arts organizations in our community um, that have been struggling a lot during this past year, as everyone has. Um, and so I just want to highlight that there are many much smaller arts organizations who are often doing frontline work, ensuring the community health and wellness of our of our diverse communities in Buffalo. And I, I do want to thank the county for the for how they've made the cultural funding process more streamlined for smaller arts organizations. Um, and really just lift up that one of the most important things we need to ensure that we don't lose any of our small arts organizations in the next few years um, is we need continuous uh, operational support and we're grateful for the ways in which the county has offered that and will continue to so just want to make space for that thank you heather i i do agree about the size of the organizations i feel like there's this category of micro organization where we have a lot of those as cultural funding recipients um, and and I love I love Buffalo Art Studio so much. I, it's uh, Alma and I are very close. It's just more like looking at uh, maybe who's not even represented here. Absolutely. Does anyone else have comments on um, what you would like funders to keep in mind moving forward? Oh, Todd. Todd. <laughs> Are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, hi everyone, it's Todd from the Big Easy in Buffalo. And just building off a couple of, of the other comments, I think the one thing that I'd love for uh, funders to keep in mind right now is that there are no wrong answers. That whether, you're, whether you completely shut down or tried to keep going, whether you're virtual or in-person or hybrid, whether you reached out to individual donors or asked those donors to um, contribute to other organizations that that you know maybe needed the help, maybe even non-cultural organizations in the short term. Uh, even now, you know, we're, as we're listening to this today, we're hearing about uh, we switched to virtual and got so many people in, or we you know managed to press forward and do so many things. Right now, it's it's really about how we've been able to preserve our missions and how we've been able to support each other. And I think that that trial and error and that um, space to experiment, I mean, no one knows what's coming next. And so any answer is a good one right now. And, and I think that as long as we hold that with us and all try to collectively lift up the community and meet our missions, that that should be kind of front of mind right now. Thanks. Thank you, Todd. I believe Legislator Baskin was able to rejoin us. I am trying to find, sorry, I have like a, too many screens open over here. So I'm running through them. Um, somewhere. Mm. technical difficulties on this end. I apologize, everyone. Seems inevitable, no matter how much you press it. Did anyone else have any comments on this particular question? Um, what do you want funders to keep in mind going forward? Our next question is, what are your needs to recover from the pandemic that were not addressed earlier? Again, what are your needs? And I put this in the chat as well, in case you can't hear me quite well. What are your needs to recover from the pandemic that were not addressed earlier? And I can go back in the slides if you need me to highlight anything in particular.
does this mean then that we were really, that we were able to cover all of your needs through the needs survey? I know there was a lot of different concerns in there. No, I can't go back apparently. Oops, my screen froze. There we go. I'm just going back to the survey pages where we were, um, oh, if I can. Sorry, apparently my computer can't handle all this. Where we talked about the needs. Someone asked, is there a small cultural incubator that's managed for the county, for example, to help new or small cultures with one or zero staff? The county, as a governmental unit, does not have a small cultural incubator. Um, for organizations that are interested in applying for cultural funding, usually they can contact me. However, for this sort of thing, we usually refer them to ASI. Do you have any information on um, to help new or small cultural with very small staff, Jen? Or Holly? Um, what I what I will add is, I mean, typically um, when when we look at our professional development and kind of one on one consultations, we'll um, you know we'll talk with organizations at whatever phase career level that they're at, whether it's startup, you know, in the middle, you know, been around for a hundred plus years, it, it doesn't make a difference to us, but um, you know, kind of talking out specifically what their needs are and trying to identify if, um, because I don't want to pretend like we have all of the answers, um, because we most definitely don't, um, but looking at who can we connect them to, to help them take that next step. So if it's that, you know, maybe, maybe they're not a formal nonprofit yet. Uh, we see a lot of this. Um, maybe you're not a formal nonprofit yet, but you want to go that route. Um, we'll talk to you about kind of the pros and cons of maybe your coalition and you're looking to go into that model. Why do you want to do that? Explore that. Um, also, I mentioned earlier the fiscal sponsorship uh, model that we offer. Um, in some cases, maybe it doesn't make sense to become a, a, a formal nonprofit, but maybe uh, being fiscal sponsored, those has uh, their pros and cons. Um, so really looking at that, but it, it really depends on a case by case basis. So we're always here and happy to help and, and connect those groups. Um, but as far as kind of a formal incubator, if you think about, you know, in, in the for profit world, they have a lot of, you know, small business development centers um, and, and things like that. There are some resources that we can provide, uh, but not necessarily take you all the way through that. I think it really starts to get into, um, you know, strategic planning and, and kind of looking It just it. I don't want to put a one size fits all <laughs> even onto my response right now. Um, but yeah, we are always open for those conversations. So we, we can start there and, and see where that leads us to. And I don't know if Holly wanted to mention anything on top of what I just said. No, I think that's perfect. Just reach out to us, contact us, um, whether it's Jen, Jen at ASIWNY.org. You can contact me, Holly. H O L L Y at A S I W N Y dot org or info email. We're happy to set up a conversation and just get more specifics about your situation and help make recommendations or provide guidance as we're able. That was Jen at ASI dot org, right? And Holly. I'll just type this into the Yeah, A S I W N Y. Org. There we go. Um, someone mentioned sustained multi year support. I'm not sure what that was answering to, but yes. Are there any other um, comments, questions, concerns? 
or answers to what are your needs to recover from the pandemic that were not addressed earlier? Trying to see if anyone has their hand up. Please, if you were already called, please use the lower hand function or so I can check who wants to speak next. Heather, did you want to speak next? Yeah, I wanted to speak to that. Thank you, Mary Ellie. Um, the one thing I wanted to say is, uh, you know, again, looking at the impacts from the 2008 financial crisis, it really takes a few years for these impacts to be felt and reverberate outward, um, especially for cultural nonprofits. Um, so I think I just want to lift up to funders that, you know, it is going to take, and I, and I was the one who wrote the comment about sustained multi-year support. I think we need that more than ever now in the next three to five years, um, because just because, you know, within the next year, the general population may be uh, vaccinated, we may feel like we're moving on, but those uh, financial reverberations will affect the cultural community for a year, a, a number of years in order for us to stabilize. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. All right, we had one more question we wanted to ask, and that was, uh, has anyone applied or uh, tried to apply and was not eligible for federal or state aid, anyone falling through the cracks, uh, and when the circumstances of that might be so we can uh, be aware of it going forward? Hi, it's Todd again. Um, to reflect a comment from earlier, I think for the small list organizations, micro organizations, as you called them, um, ones with volunteer staff, especially, um, there were a lot of funding opportunities that weren't available uh, to organizations like ours. Uh, the, you know, in the Recovery Act, the NEA funding, you had to be an NEA recipient. NISCA funding, you had to be a NISCA recipient, and DEC recipients didn't count among. NISCA recipients, um, you know, PPP employees. Um, so, you know, ASI actually, the, the funding that, that ASI did with um, Fund for the Arts was one of the rare opportunities that, that really was for everyone. So, I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's absolutely a subgroup of organizations out there, a lot of them on the front line that have not been eligible for most, if not almost all of the funding that uh, that has been out there. And I know there's another round of cultural funding coming um, through, you know, this last uh, this last round. But if the uh, eligibility is the same as last time, uh, it will just be more of the same for us. Thank you, Mary. Sorry, I was muted. I was just saying I was handling a, a tech question and this is, you can unmute yourself. Uh, we wanted to use the raise hand in case there was a lot of speakers all at once, but it doesn't seem to be a concern. So feel free to unmute yourself and share your comments, your statements if you have them. Um, I believe someone was trying to, uh, let's see, someone can't unmute themselves, let's see. Matt Dunning, can you speak now? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, 
I can hear you. Oh, wow. Cool. Sorry, I joined late. Um, I just wanted to um, sort of back up what Todd just said. New Centaur Arts, you know, we're a new organization. We've only been around officially since 2019. So we totally fell through the cracks and almost all the funding that was available, except for the AI funding, which was one. Yeah, that AI screwed last year. Um, Sorry, Matt, I think your audio cut out a little bit. Uh, fund the organizations that may have applied last year that did not uh, receive funding last year uh, because of the COVID crisis, because, you know, we're like basically a year behind now uh, in that process because of, of what went on uh, with COVID, you know, and it's like for a growing organization, that's a very precarious position to be in because, you know, we're trying to raise the funds for our operating expenses so we can be sustainable. Um, you can all be, you know, forever with a growing organization. People need to get paid. Operations costs need to be paid. Um, and if you don't do that, you know, your programming is going to suffer or your people are going to burn out. So I would like to back up Todd. I'd like to back up Heather on, on all their comments that I've, I've heard since joining the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I believe uh, Amelia would like to speak. Are you able to unmute yourself? Why? Thank you. I was just messaging you that I could not. Um, so I, I maybe more have an, an advice question, um, but you know, with the with Erie County cultural funding, I think we're we're all grateful, regardless of size of of organization, um, sort of the new process and and how it's streamlined into kind of those three different categories. But um, a a lot of our organizations have kind of been stuck at the same level of funding with the county, regardless of an increase or change in size, or um, not even necessarily size, but sometimes just impact or service they have on the community. Um, and I'm just wondering what some people maybe have found successful about ways to, whether it's better articulate or, or, you know, any ways to change their level of funding that they receive from the Erie County Cultural Grant each year as they grow or increase their impact that they have on the people of Erie County. Unfortunately, the main people who can answer that had to uh, leave the call, which would be either the county executive or the uh, the legislature, because the environment, the Department of Environment and Planning, and uh, the Arts Board do not control the actual funding amount. Um, they give us a, a sort of a benchmark top end amount. We try to put all the organizations in there. Um, and we've been trying to make a more equitable effort to make sure that organizations that haven't been getting an increase or um, new organizations that started kind of way behind the ones that have been in for a long time, that it kind of evens out a little bit more. Um, but that is definitely a question that we would have to put towards the county executive or the legislature. legislature. Um, and because the, really that's how that's the best way for us to be able to advocate that for you. I think uh, last year or the year before, I can't remember years anymore. We were able to make the changes to the to the application because of the community feedback from uh, with legislator Baskin and Frontline Arts Buffalo to bring that concern forward to the point where I could actually do something about it. The board could do something about it. Our department could do something about it. Um, so these sorts of things definitely need to start with the community and the sector. Um, I, I don't know if uh, Graham wants to add anything as board chair. Uh, I agree uh, with what you just said. Certainly, um, it is the legislature that ultimately makes the decision um, in terms of how the board operates. It is a um, 
really uh, uh, um, looking at sort of the fundamentals, but uh, in terms of recommendations, I mean, if we see an organization that's doing really well, then the recommendation typically is to increase. Um, it's just sort of the the ability uh, for the legislature, I think, to make sort of increases as well. Um, and I mean, there's sort of an in there's sort of a built in. Uh, um, if you've reached a certain level, your you know the inc the percentage increase potentially is going to be considerably larger if you're getting more obviously than if you're uh, getting less, even though it's uh, an equivalent um, percentage increase. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, uh, in terms of how the board operates, it's, it certainly is a, um, you know, uh, we recommend either uh, maintaining current or, uh, or going up or, or, or in some cases potentially going down, I guess, as well um, to the uh, county executive. And then that goes into the um, budget making process with the legislature. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with what Marielle said in terms of sort of raising the issue, uh, I think, community wise, uh, because I think that's where you're going to see some traction uh, in terms of that as well. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Anne, did you have Anne McCooey? Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, I, in response to the question about were we, um, did we fall through the cracks and the Black River said Lions definitely fell through the cracks and primarily because we don't have any employees. Um, you know, we hire contract, independent contractors for project work that's based on grants that we've received um, for projects that need to happen. But when it came to operations, we are all volunteers. So, you know, we weren't capable of applying where we weren't qualified to apply for any of the grants. And, you know, there doesn't seem to be, that's one of those questions that when you say, no, you don't have any employees, that automatically disqualifies you for it. But it doesn't mean that we didn't struggle with our fund, with funding, with operational funding um, last year. Well, more so this year than last year because we had our money in for last year already in our grants to run our operations. Um, but so many of our funders, you know, pulled their support for project work to focus on funding for recovery and um, keeping keeping organizations open. So, um, you know, I just wanted to throw that in that. Yeah, there are a lot of us that don't have staff that still need to be able to have a funding source. Thank you. Was there anyone else that wanted to share any information, ask any questions. We're almost at 3 o'clock. Do any of the panelists have some uh, final words before we wrap up? Unless, oh, wait, someone has a question. Sorry. Brian Lee. Hi everyone, this is Brian Lee uh, from El Museo. Um, I had a question for um, for Niska, uh, who I noticed is on this call. Um, if there is any information that you can share about um, this year's uh, funding application, as well as the hundred million dollar um, rescue funding that was announced um, recently. Karen, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for the question. I appreciate that. Uh, please uh, allow me and forgive me for not being able to answer this directly. Um, I am taking notes only today for NISCA and we um, are sorry that we could not have uh, executive representation today due to conflicts and, but, uh, 
I do encourage uh, everyone to continue to keep an eye on our website, arts, A-R-T-S dot N-Y dot gov. And uh, there is uh, a daily update and routine information. We hope to have more direct uh, information in regard to the question up very soon. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, if the panelists have any final thoughts or comments, I think we're mostly okay. I think that needs assessment was more uh, effective than we expected it to be. So yeah, I think. Can uh, I? Oh, yeah, it's Jen. Can I add in one quick comment? Um, just okay. based on a, a conversation I have with uh, one of the attendees. Um, somebody asked us uh, at ASI if we're going to do another audience uh, readiness survey. So that was something that we actually did um, mid. Oh, I can't remember the time frame now. Um, so at some point in 2020, we put together an audience readiness survey that organizations could use to share with their patrons, their audiences, uh, to really gauge collective sector data as to when, how, why uh, audience members would feel ready to go back uh, in whatever platform that is, so virtual or in person. Um, so actually, because of all the changes and because the last time we did that, Everything and nothing <laughs> has changed all at the same time. Uh, we will be putting uh, another 1 of those together. So everyone can look out for that and um, we, we will put it together on ASI's end and organizations can feel free to use that as part of your communications uh, to your patrons and audience members um, and in tandem we will collect all of that data as a sector um, to share that with everyone. Thank you. Mary Ellie, it's Jennifer from the health department. Um, I should be getting notice out to folks who are interested in participating in um, a Q and A uh, webinar similar to this, um, probably early next week. Um, so if anybody does want to be invited to that, if they could either email me at large events or, um, and I can try to get emails out to everybody here in the very new future with that information. Awesome, thank you. And thank you, Jen, for that info as well. Anyone else? Uh, well, Mary, I'm going to wrap things up since it sounds like everybody's uh, had to say what they've had to say. I first and foremost want to thank all of you panelists and all of you participants, uh, ASI, Community Foundation, uh, Fund for the Arts, our Department of Health speakers, uh, the County Executive, Legislator Baskin, uh, Cindy from the VBN, Graham, everybody. This has been a great, uh, uh, a, a great opportunity that we've provided for our cultural community. Um, there's been a lot of good information. As you said, we've got a lot good in the uh, survey, so we've got a lot of good information to go forward. Uh, what we're going to do is um, work with uh, ASI and um, Mary Ellie are going to work together to put a uh, combination report together of what's of the survey and the uh, and the town hall today that'll be presented to the county executive and to legislator Baskins uh, with um, you know ideas on uh, what ways and things that you know we've learned that we can help a cultural organizations uh, better prepare and uh, and uh, better. Uh, you know, handle the the reopening and um, the uh, you know the the re-entertaining of of a of an actual um, audience. So uh, thank you guys all for being a part of this. Uh, thank you all your cultural agents uh, agencies for uh, for joining on and uh, sharing your experiences. Um, like I said, there will be uh, some follow up from here from the county and from Mary Alley and from ASI. Uh, you guys will all be aware of that and we will, uh, you know, continue to try to see what we can do to um, hopefully help 
uh, in a hundred percent rebound of uh, of our cultural community. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.